Good morning. Good to see so many people out this morning. Happy New Year. It's not only the first day of the new year, as it's been said, but also the first day of the week. So we're gathered together here to praise our, our Lord and Savior, to lift our voices up to him in song and to study from his word and to partake of the Lord's Supper. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is in a lesson entitled, In Remembrance, taking our text from Luke 22, 19 to 20. I want to thank Josiah for reading that for us. And we're going to be turning there very shortly. We had an opportunity of something that we've always wanted to do on our way home from Ohio this past week. Uh, we'd always talked about it in all the, the many years we've been making that trip every other year that we've gone to Ohio. We always said as we came through Pennsylvania, you know, it's just a little bit out of our way. One day we want to stop at the Flight 93 Memorial. And this time we did. Cultures in times past have erected memorials and tributes to remember acts of violence and tragedies and to remember the people affected. On our way home, we stopped in Shanksville, Pennsylvania to visit the Flight 93 Memorial. You know, this was different from many memorials across our nation. This memorial does not honor soldiers, soldiers who volunteer and sign up for danger. No, this memorial is different. It's set up for everyday citizens who didn't sign up for a fight for their lives. They were just an ordinary flight on an ordinary day filled with ordinary people. They were going about their lives to jobs, to conferences, going home to visit family, going on vacation, and their lives are documented now in a museum. Their plane was delayed about 25 minutes. That delay was not counted on by the terrorists who later hijacked that plane shortly after takeoff. That delay of 25 minutes gave the passengers time that by the time they started making phone calls to their loved ones, they got the information from their loved ones over the phone that three planes had already been used as weapons, two into the World Trade Center and one into the Pentagon. Within 20 minutes from takeoff, they would find themselves banded together in the back of the plane, those who had survived because the terrorists had killed many passengers and crew. And those who survived found themselves banded together in the back of a plane not knowing where they were headed, not knowing what was going to happen. They found themselves making phone calls to their loved ones. Some of those calls were recorded because they reached voicemail. And then they made a plan. They were not going to allow their plane to be used as a weapon. And they formed a plan and they attacked the terrorists on board. This attack caused the plane to nosedive at 586 miles per hour into an empty field, causing a 45-foot crater. All aboard were lost. And one of those phone calls, one of the last words, those famous last words, as they're often called, let's roll, unified and rallied a nation. And it became the battle cry of our nation for many years after that as the war on terrorism played out across Afghanistan and Iraq and many other countries. There is a quote from a first responder there that, struck with, that stuck with me. He said, a common field one day, a field of honor forever. That quote is written across this fence here that overlooks where the impact happened. You can see the hemlock trees over here that were burned in the aftermath. I didn't use the picture I took. It's hard to read because it's covered in snow. <laughs> I, I was going to use the picture that I took, but I had to take this from their website because... Uh, it was covered in snow. It was very difficult to read the sign that I had taken. But we stood in front of that, that fence there, overlooking the site. Families of three passengers and crew allowed the museum to have their recorded voicemails accessible. And there's a little phone you can pick up, and you can hear three recorded messages that the families allowed the museum to have. To me, that was one of the most moving parts of that museum was to hear the recording message of passengers and crew in their very last words. The common theme in those three recordings, though, was one of hope and love and encouragement. Some of them said, I don't know what's going to happen. I hope to see you soon. We have a plan. But the common theme was, while they didn't know what was going to happen, they did know death was a possibility. And they said, I want you to know I love you. 
That was the common theme. I want you to know I love you. In the days and the years following, many people left tributes at the site. One of these can be seen here. It says, to the first citizen heroes of the 21st century, the passengers of crew of Flight 93, let's roll with the date 9-11-2001. And it says, grateful Colorado citizens. Because these ordinary people on an ordinary flight decided they would not be used as a weapon. And they fought back. And so this memorial is set up to everyday people for acts of heroism and acts of bravery to be remembered and honored. <clears throat> One of the moving tributes to me, though, that I don't have a picture of, they had a sign in the museum saying no photography of any kind. And what's funny is I was looking for pictures because I couldn't take pictures of inside the museum. There's pictures of a lady taking a picture of one of the things I wanted to take a picture of. <laughs> but I didn't use that. I didn't want to get her in trouble. But uh, she's out, it's out there. If you look for pictures for Flight 93, you'll see it. She's there breaking the rule. But one of the moving tributes to me was from a soldier. And it gave his name and it gave a little biography of him. He enlisted because of that terrible, terrible, very bad day in our nation's history. He enlisted into the service. He volunteered. He signed up for danger. And he went and fought in Afghanistan for four years. And then in 2005, when his tour of duty was over, he came to Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and he left his combat boots on that field of honor. That was very moving to me. And while many people can visit the museum, we did. You can see the sites. You can visit the, the Tower of Silence. You can see the memorial that is built out as far as you can go into the field. But only family can go to the actual crash site. Only family of the 40, pa the 40 passengers on board. There were 44 total, 40 passengers and crew. Only family are allowed to go in and visit the site to grieve, to mourn, and to honor. As we left that memorial, and <clears throat> the various different emotions running through me, I found myself thinking of three of the things there and finding myself applying them to the Lord's Supper, this memorial that we take every first day of the week. This was my first time since 9-11-2001 going to this memorial. It's not a memorial we do every week. It's not a memorial we do even every year. But it's there for anyone to visit. But on the first day of the week, we partake of a memorial that we can read of in Luke 22, 19-20, that Josiah read for us just moments ago. And it talks about Jesus sitting at this last supper with his disciples, his closest friends and apostles. And it says, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Perhaps it brought to remembrance passages from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. When God said there was coming a day that he would create a new covenant. And Jesus is saying the price for that new covenant is my blood. And as you read the, the tributes on the wall and it gives a timeline. This was a very well done museum if you haven't been there. It is very well done. It gives you a biography of all the passengers. It gives you a timeline and who they were, where they, where they were flying. And one of the things that it talked about, the different various phone calls... As they didn't, again, I said the three that you could listen to, they didn't know what was going to happen. All they knew is they wanted to convey one thing, and that is, I love you. As we read about Jesus and his last moments with his apostles, he knew what was going to happen. He knew in graphic detail what was going to happen, and he told them how he wanted to be remembered. Those people on the phone telling, talking to their loved ones, they didn't tell them how they wanted to be remembered. They just said they wanted them to remember their words that they loved them. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And he told them how he wanted them to remember him. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 to 25, Paul relates how the Lord told him that as we eat the bread and drink the fruit of the vine, that we do so in remembrance of me. He says that's what Dick read for us at the table this morning. That Paul says he got it directly from the Lord, how he wanted to be remembered. 
As you eat the bread, as you drink the fruit of the vine, do this in remembrance of me. The early church did it on the first day of the week, Sunday, when they came together to break bread as the church. We see it in an example of it in Acts 20 and verse 7. You see in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18 and verse 33, where it says they come together as the church. We're told in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 2, they came together every first day of the week. Jews celebrated the Passover, God's deliverance of his people from the bondage of Egypt in their first month of the new year. Christians celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus' deliverance of his people from the bondage of sin every first day of the week. And how fitting it is that the first day of the new year falls on the first day of the week. And as the world looks at it as a chance to party and to sleep in and overcome their hangovers, here we see God's people gathered together in one place that we might remember the Lord and remember the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. From violence and tragedy comes honor and remembrance. That happens in our lives. We memorialize great men and women, soldiers, citizens. And we see it in the Lord. From violence and tragedy comes honor and remembrance. There were three things about that memorial that struck out to me. And the first of which was it said a common field one day, a field of honor forever. In Luke 22, 19 to 20, as Jesus is eating the Passover with his apostles, he celebrated this Passover one last time before his death. And he took the bread. We know it's unleavened from Exodus 12, verse 17. He said it symbolized his body that was broken for them, and they were to remember him as they eat it. And you might think about how perplexed they might have been sitting there with him. It hadn't happened yet. He's still with them, and he says, as you eat it, remember me. Well, those words would come back later, after the violence and the tragedy of that night. Then he took the cup that contained the fruit of the vine. Luke twenty two eighteen 18 tells us what was in that cup. And he told them it was the new covenant in his blood. They were to remember him as often as they drink it. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, as Paul relates, do this in remembrance of me. He was still with them at this time. They didn't fully grasp what was about to happen. You know, there was nothing special about that bread and that fruit of the vine. It was eaten every year. It was drank every year at the Passover. <clears throat> Jesus took something common. Common bread, common juice that makes up the Lord's Supper. And he made it forever. An honorable memorial to Jesus because of his sacrifice for our sins. Something common was turned into something honorable and memorable. Something we remember still to this day thousands of years later. Every first day of the week. It was a common meal, honored forever. The other thing that stuck out about that memorial to me was the last words recorded. It really was a moving tribute to be able to hear the voices of the passengers and crew that were recorded, to hear their last words and to hear them say, I love you, to their loved ones. It choked me up. It got to me. Because they didn't know what was about to happen. But they knew one thing. They knew what they wanted their loved ones to know about them. And to remember about them. We have Jesus' last words recorded for us. They were words of comfort. They were words of love. And they were words of hope. In his prayer in the garden of Gethsemane, the night that he would be betrayed by one of his own. He turned his thoughts off of his coming suffering. In John chapter 17. And he prayed for his apostles and companions, his friends, in John 17, 6 through 23. And then he turned his attention to pray for us. He prayed for all of those who would believe on him through their word. Brethren, he's speaking about you and me all these years later. Those last words of Jesus recorded are for you and for me. He spoke of love and unity, that we would be one as he and the Father were one. On the cross, the very next day, Jesus said of those who were putting him to death, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, in Luke 23 and verse 34. One of his very last words on the cross 
was of forgiveness. And we've talked about the cross before, about the way that it killed. You asphyxiated. Your body dropped and you were going to die from its own weight. In order to speak, you had to lift yourself up to speak. And so the seven words that we have of Jesus on the cross, you can imagine each time he had to place weight on the nail on, in his feet and think of the pain, pull on the nails in his hands to lift himself up to be able to get air in his lungs to speak. And one of those times he did some, a maneuver like that, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he's speaking about the very ones who nailed him on that cross, the very ones who delivered him up to Pilate for that sentence of death. As his earthly body gave out, in Luke 23, verse 46, right before he breathed his last, in John 19, 30, in one of those moments that he would have had to lift himself up on the cross, he said, it is finished. And then as Luke 23, 46 records, he breathed his last. In that phrase, it is finished, he spoke of fulfillment. He came to do all that he was sent to do. And when I think of that, I'm reminded of Luke 19.10, where kind of his mission statement on earth, he says, I've, came, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And then he says, it is finished. We're told that his motivation for his sacrifice was love in Romans 5. And verse 8. And if you read all the way through Romans 5, 6 through 10, here the Apostle Paul paints a grim picture of who we are in contrast to Jesus. He says, Jesus died for the helpless, for the ungodly, for sinners, and for enemies. And he saved them from the wrath of God, reconciling them to God in his death. Jesus willingly died for you and for me. He knew what was going to happen. And he was very careful in the last words that would be recorded before his death that his apostles would remember those things, know how he wanted to be remembered, and know how much he loved them. He speaks of love and unity in John 17. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is by this that draws us even closer to Jesus, and we do it every first day of the week. The third thing that I was struck with as I walked away from that memorial was family has a closer connection. Anyone can go to the Flight 93 memorial, but only the families of the heroes on board that day can go to the actual crash site. Only they can see what remains of that 45-foot crater where a coroner spent years piecing together and was able to give closure to every single family saying, the DNA collected represented all 44 passengers on board. But it took years of that coroner's life to give them that peace. And now they can go to that crash site, they can grieve, they can mourn, they can remember. <clears throat> and I thought about the Lord's Supper, of what it's like for children growing up in the church, for visitors who come into our midst and they see it partaken of, Anyone, children and visitors, can observe and partake of the Lord's Supper, but only those who've been obedient to the gospel and entered the family of God can truly share in Jesus' sacrifice. I want you to think about this with me. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9 to 10, Philippians 1, 27, Romans 15, 5 to 6, and Philippians 3, 10, I'm going to summarize some of the phrases from these passages. Saints are called to fellowship with Christ to strive together to be of the same mind, sharing in our faith, and the same judgment, being partakers of the same goal. Standing firm in one spirit, that is the same goal of pleasing God, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, that is the same doctrine, and to have fellowship in his sufferings. This is not a command to the people of the world. These are things said that the children of God do. That we fellowship with Christ and we fellowship with one another. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, it says that you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Children and visitors who partake of the Lord's Supper, that's not what they're proclaiming. 
They don't know that. They don't have that deeper connection with Christ. But people of the family of God do. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper and we think about making it personal, that he died for my sins, that he put himself on the cross so I didn't have to, that I never had to suffer the wrath of God. When I take of the Lord's Supper, when I eat the bread and I drink the cup and I remember him, through that observance of the Lord's Supper, I proclaim his death until he comes again. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 tells us how personal a sharing with Christ is made possible in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. That by our partaking of it, we proclaim to the world that Jesus died for sins and he will return. That's the promise. He is coming back. And only the family of God can proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17, Paul makes a very explicit and very impressive argument on the nature of fellowship and sharing. In the assembly of the saints, when the bread and the fruit of the vine are taken in commemoration of Jesus' death, there is a sharing. The word that's used there, the Greek word, is, is that it means fellowship, partakers. We become a sharer with Christ's body. We become a sharer with the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. We become a partaker with his body and his blood through the bread and the fruit of the vine. And therefore, it is a personal sharing with Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16 says. Let's go ahead and turn over there and read this passage and see how deep a meaning it has when we partake of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 10 16, it says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. He says when we drink the cup, when we take the bread, we share with his body, we share in his blood. What he's telling us there in 1 Corinthians 10, 17 is there is fellowship with Christ there's fellowship with Christ and Christians, and there's fellowship of Christians with each other as we are all members of the same body in Christ. Through partaking of the Lord's Supper, we share in Christ's blood, and we share in Christ's body. There's no other aspect in life, in our Christian walk with God, that we have a more intimate sharing or fellowship with Christ than in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. In the family of God, we have fellowship with Jesus and with one another. And it's very personal. Flight 93. We're told as you visit that memorial, it was an ordinary flight. It was ordinary people going about doing ordinary things. But in their last moments, they chose to do something extraordinary. They chose to do something heroic not knowing what the outcome would be. They definitely probably did not know that it was going to nosedive at 586 miles per hour into an empty field. But they did know they were not, allow, they were not going to allow that plane to be used as a weapon to hurt other Americans. And in that, they were successful. In that, they succeeded. And in that, they did something to honor and remember. What about you? None of us knows how much time we have. The passengers on Flight 93 did something extraordinary at the time that they had left. They didn't know how much time they had either. They didn't know that by the time they did that, they had two minutes. You don't know what time you have left. But what I want to tell you is with the time that you do have remaining, you can do something extraordinary now while you yet live. You can repent and be baptized and obey the gospel and become a child of God. And enter into the family of God, knowing that you have the hope of an eternal life. You have a hope of a home made for you in heaven with God Almighty. You know that your sins will be forgiven and that you have a mediator in Christ who died for you. You can repent and be renewed in the eyes of God if you have strayed or have sin in your life. You can make it right. 
And know that as we come together as saints, as children of God, as the family of God, we honor Jesus every first day of the week for his sacrifice in which he made to redeem us from sin. And this morning, you can become part of the family of God and dedicate your life to live for him. There's no other extraordinary thing that you can do in this life than to become a member of God's family, to have that hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life, where God will remember and honor you for all eternity as we praise, honor, and express our love to him for all eternity. If you are not a Christian this morning, we encourage you to become one to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And if you are a Christian with sin in your life, don't wait till it's too late. Don't make a bucket list of one day things that you want to repent of. Make it now. Repent now while you draw breath and be renewed to the fold of God. And if we can assist you in any of these things, the prayers of the congregation or the waters of baptism, come forward, let your request be known now while together we stand and sing.